the Associate Director of our Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies. It is my great pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to introduce our next speaker. Anna Krogart is a cult cultural anthropologist who studies, among other things, migration and displacement in North America and more recently in Southeast Europe, with a focus on the post-Cold War era. Her interests include the role of urban material culture and consumption in transformations and race and ethnic, gender, religious, and political subjectivities in the American Midwest and in Bosnia-Herzegovina, the links among human rights and feminist discourses, social movements, and imperialism, and tracing the effects of political violence. A recent illustration of this work will appear in the journal American Anthropologists. Who has time for chafe? Post-socialist migration, work, and slow coffee in neoliberal Chicago. She previously was visiting assistant professor in gender studies at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, and is currently visiting professor in the Department of Anthropology at Loyola University, where she also teaches in women and gender studies. Please welcome Anna Kroger. Thank you, Meredith. If I get too loud, will you tell me? But after sitting in this room for the morning and this afternoon, I kind of realized that there's a lot of outside noise going on, so I'm going to talk loud. But if I get too loud, just tell me to be quiet. <laughs> um, thanks a lot for, um, to all of you. I think it's really cool that you're all here today and um, yesterday and tomorrow uh, learning more about these issues. And, um, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to speak with so many teachers. How many of you teach in the Chicago area? Wow, and how many of you kind of in the Midwest in general? Okay, <laughs> one other Mid Midwesterner. Okay, so a lot of you in the Chicago area. That's, that's great. Um, I also just want to thank Jamie uh, and, and the Summer Teaching Institute for having me here, as well as Andy Gran, who's not here um, anymore, but he's not here for a good reason, um, moving on to bigger and better things. Um, uh, not that this isn't big and better, but it's <laughs> but he, what he was looking for. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'm really happy to be here. And I'm also, it's really an honor, I mean, he's, I, I guess he left, but it's really an honor to follow someone as prolific as Howard Edelman. Um, I feel really honored to be speaking after him. So um, that's pretty cool, too. Uh, let's see. So... What I'm going to do today is uh, talk a little bit differently than uh, you've heard in the, at least the three previous uh, papers that, that I was here for, and really kind of approach this from a case study point of view. Um, I think that's a nice way to teach from um, about something like refugees and migration that are really enormous topics. Um, but also, as you've probably realized by now, quite varied. Refugee populations vary a great deal um, in terms of whether or not you spend time in a camp, in terms of how long you spend time in a camp, um, where you spend time in a camp, if you're able to get some kind of asylum status, if you want to go back and um, kind of take part in the non-refoulement agreement or not. Um, all of these things, refugee, um, is a, very, is a very varied category, um, which is what Howard Edelman has shown in his work, as well as the work that he mentioned before of anthropologist Lisa Malky, really talking about the refugee category as, as a socially constructed category, not just an official category um, that comes with a whole bunch of set of um, feelings and sentiments and subjectivities attached to it. So um, we, we can't really kind of blanket statement refugee experiences um, and refugee trajectories. So today I'm going to talk specifically about uh, migration from former Yugoslavia, mostly from Bosnia and Herzegovina, as a result of the wars in the 1990s. But I'm going to start us off actually about a century earlier so that we have a little bit of a sense of the history behind that migration. Because one of the misnomers also about refugee migrants is that they're kind of completely uh, disassociated from other previous mi migration communities. And this certainly was not the case for people coming from former Yugoslavia. 
excuse me, Yugoslavia, people have been migrating from uh, Southeast Europe to the United States and to North America and the Great Lakes region in particular um, over the course of the 20th century and prior to the start of the 20th century. Um, and so that has an impact on how these new refugees are received and integrated into um, the, the communities that they, that they come to as refugees in the 1990s. So we've got a couple of uh, photographs here that I took. I'm sorry this one is so shadowy, and we'll come back to both of them later. Um, the first one is uh, here in Chicago at the Devon Market, if any of you ever shop there on the north side. Um, a whole bunch of coffee products primarily from former Yugoslavia. And the right um, very foggy picture has uh, a woman activist from uh, Srebrenica, um, another Bosnian American woman behind her, and then in front of her is Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, and that's on Capitol Hill um, at an International Women's Day event in 2009. So I'll talk more about those, but the way that I'm going to um, propose that we approach the topic today also is through three categories. I'm going to kind of talk about this from the perspective of gender and what does a gender lens provide us in understanding forms of migration. And I'm going to talk about three categories where that matters as the nation and, and the home and the body. Um, so kind of three ways, three categories that I think we can, can use to, to think about this. I'm going to have to go through these slides that have my notes on them because the computer doesn't want to let me read my notes. So as I said, we're going to use that kind of nation, home, body um, framework to move through, through this, this topic. But I want to start us with some a little bit of history. So the Yugoslav Wars, um, of which you heard out, uh, Howard kind of refer to specifically in the refugee context, um, were wars that hap were among conflicts that took place over power and legitimacy in the wake of official end to communism in Eastern, Central, and Southeastern Europe. So we've heard a lot today about kind of massive transformations in climate change that move populations. But for those of us who can remember the Cold War and kind of the official end to it in 1989, 1990, 1991, this was a tremendous um, upheaval in the lives of many, 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 many people. Um, so we're talking about kind of large-scale political and economic transformation that send people um, migrating. Uh, so you kind of officially have wars in Croatia that happen in 1991. The conflict continues until 1995. The longest and most sustained conflict um, is in Bosnia-Herzegovina from 1992 to 1995. Um, and then you have Kosovo from 1999 to 2000. Um, how many of you remember where Yugoslavia was, is? A couple of you? Yeah. Um, Yugoslavia was, was a state that um, was formally founded after World War II and had six uh, constituent republics and after the 19, early 1970s, two semi-autonomous provinces of which Kosovo was one. Um, so I'm going to take you way back here to the Treaty of Berlin. Uh, this is in 1878, and this kind of shows us the way in which the Balkan Peninsula here, I see I keep wanting to point with my hand, but I have this nifty little pointer thingy. Ooh. Okay, this is a cool map too because it's from a woodcut. Um, so here is the Balkan Peninsula. Istanbul. Okay, I'm having too much fun. Um, okay, so so here's uh, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro, Macedonia. You can see that the state borders aren't there. There's a lot of conflict and political upheaval happening. It's the frontier of Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman um, kind of battles for 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 power over in the region. Um, so one of the things that the key tells us here is that the brown is telling us that Austria-Hungary Austria -Hungary got um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this little 
sliver here that actually abuts Kosovo, the Sanjak region, which was an important region under Ottoman times um, and was predominantly Muslim uh, population. Uh, so that gives you a sense of kind of one way of looking at the Balkan Peninsula in 1878. And those transformations, the kind of conflict and then decline of both the Austro-Hungarian and the Ottoman empires sent enormous numbers of migrants to um, places like the US um, and other parts of, of Europe and, and Asia. Uh, so here's a map of the peninsula again. We see some of the boundaries from uh, 1923, so kind of post-World War I. And then here's the state, so here's the Adriatic, and here's the, the um, Yugoslav state for, that was uh, from 19, 90, 1944 to 1991. So you can see, again, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, Macedonia, uh, and then you've got Kosovo in there, and Vojvodina is up here, I think, if I'm right. Um, so the six constituent republics, not really right <laughs> for Vojvodina? <laughs> okay. Right, the semi-autonomous provinces, as, as well as Kosovo. So you have a ton of cultural and ethnic diversity. Some people like to map this out. Um, so we have these little nifty ethnic map keys here um, uh, for both Yugoslavia and for Bosnia-Herzegovina in particular. So this one map to the left tells us that um, there are Albanians, Muslim Slavs, many who now identify as Bosniak, um, Croats, Slovenes, Hungarians, Macedonians, Montenegrins, and Serbs. Uh, there's many other ethnic populations that are present, notably absent are Roma populations, which there were and continue to be Roma populations in former Yugoslavia. Um, and then here's Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, and another little kind of ethnic map breakdown that's showing us in the yellow here that these are majority Croatian, Croat areas, that the purple are majority Muslim um, or Bosniak for some people who refer to themselves that way. Um, and here's uh, the pink is Serb, and then the brown parts tell us that those areas are so ethnically mixed that there's not a kind of one predominating um, ethnic group. Um, and you'll see that those lines in some ways kind of loosely outline what became in um, kind of officially stated in the Dayton Accords, the division, um, uh, the partitioning of the state, post-war state, into the Republika Srpska and um, the Federation territories. Uh, the state is still partitioned in that, in that way um, today. So tons of cultural and ethnic diversity in this, in this particular part of the peninsula, but all over the Balkan Peninsula. Um, and uh, here I have a little postcard from Sarajevo that dates to the late 19th century. Sarajevo has, a, has also, for many of you who are familiar with the area, or have, maybe the only thing you've heard of it is, is about Sarajevo, but it's kind of this um, uh, a, 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 an icon of, of multiculturalism and, and diversity in the region. Um, so you've got Cyrillic, Latin, and Arabic scripts in here. You've got buildings in the town center that reflect Austro-Hungarian offices of state, but also Orthodox and Catholic churches and the Ferhat Mosque. Um, Ferhagia. So uh, yes, incredibly diverse. Um, and I'm not going to show you a lot of, I'm not going to show pictures. Um, I guess I have one picture of the war. Um, but I'll show you a couple of photographs. So here um, are photographs that I took in 2009. Um, this is a Sarajevo rose, um, which is what they call these imprints in Sarajevo, which was under siege for almost three years, um, where the shrapnel marked um, and damaged the concrete and killed at least one person. They filled it in with a red, um, uh, uh, what do we want to call that, um, clay, something like that. Um, to to uh, commemorate. So instead of just kind of uh, covering up that that history in the physical landscape, this is a way of, of commemorating the fact of the siege um, and the many people who died during during the fighting in in the city. 
Um, this is also is a building, if you can see, I mean, kind of completely, uh, I mean, it looks like an abandoned building. It is an abandoned building. Um, but it's in, it's in the downtown central area city of Mostar in Herzegovina. Um, and it's on the eastern side of the Noretva, kind of on the front lines of where the fighting was there. And things are still very tense right now in Mostar. So um, there's a whole lot of conflict over and, and stall in post-war reconstruction in certain areas, claims over who is entitled to what properties and who has responsibility for maintaining and, and renewing those properties is uh, still highly, um, highly contested in certain areas, and uh, most are in particular. So as a result of these wars, we have 2.5 million people displaced. And you learned this morning, for, if you didn't know, about internal displacement versus kind of refugee status. Um, so about half of those people, a little more than half, um, internally displaced. Um, and then one million outside of former Yugoslav borders. Um, so kind of a massive, if you think about that, and especially given that most of those refugees are coming from Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is a you know, little republic that has a population now and had a population before of about four and a half million people, um, it's quite a massive um, shift in, in population there. Uh, you had individual homes and collective religious and cultural sites targeted, in particular Ottoman era um, architecture. So you had all kinds of cultural and religious sites, but especially the Ottoman era um, structures were, were, were targeted. More than 200,000 people killed and uh, more than 20,000 women raped. I thought it was interesting this morning we had this conversation about women going to get firewood um, and everybody kept talking about safety but nobody said why are we worried about these women's safety when they go to get firewood out of the camp. Um, and I mean, it's partly because when there have been documented rapes of women who have gone too far from camps to procure um, firewood, water, and other kinds of materials. Um, and so, uh, rape is um, is an act of warfare, just like uh, genocide. And w in terms of how Howard uh, stated it earlier, it's not a new phenomenon, not a new tactic. Um, and was heavily practiced um, during, during these wars. So one of the things that, you, that, that kind of caused this war and some of the fears that followed it, and I'm talking about this um, post-Cold post War era, is you really had what Susan Woodward has called a withering away of the state of Yugoslavia. Um, you have decentralization that begins in the 1970s uh, with structural adjustment programs that were implemented per terms for IMF and World Bank agree uh, loans. So um, uh, Tito was uh, very strategic. He was uh, part of the non-aligned movement um, along with India. Yugoslavia and India were kind of the, 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 the world leaders in that movement. Um, but also it's opened to uh, Western aid earlier than other parts of the, um, you know, was not part of the Soviet bloc um, and opened it, Yugoslavia opened earlier to that aid. Um, so you have this massive decentralization, um, push towards privatization. You have uh, different development policies being pursued coincident. Um, so one was the FOTSA model and one was the Slovenia model. Um, uh, who've been talked about as developmentalist versus liberal. That's another thing for those of you, you know, again, who are kind of interested in teaching your students about these various forms of development policies. Um, that's one way in to kind of thinking about the buildup um, to, this, to this war. Uh, you have um, this increasing shrinking of the state um, and the public sector was a large provider of jobs. Um, so imagine as you kind of continue to have the loss 
I mean, we have it here now, right? So you have kind of the loss of jobs in the public sector, and you're, the, the state has to move towards privatization, but that privatization has to come, the way you kind of attract foreign direct investment is you say, oh, well, you can bring your own labor, you know? You can bring the cheapest labor, um, as for example, Libya has done, as for example, the US does. You can import your labor from other parts of the, the you know, people who are leaving other parts of the world who are willing to work for less. Um, you don't have to create jobs for the people here. Um, so this is all going on in the starting in the 1970s, but really takes effect and really feels present in people's lives in a big way in the 1980s. So there's this real fear for people about who's going to belong and doesn't belong to this post-communist state. What is it going to look like? Um, who gets to be a part of it and why? Who, who doesn't and why? Um, and one of the ways that people have these arguments and debates are about, um, are through the kind of language of kinship and ideals of masculinity and femininity. Um, so when people argue for national boundaries about who is in and who is out, there were these questions of, you know, are, they, or do, are these the mothers of all, of all of us, or the mothers of the sons of one nation, meaning, you know, the mothers of the Serbs, all Serbs in former Yugoslavia, or the mothers of, of, um, of all the Croatians. Um, people express fears about the future and hostilities about those they viewed as undesirable citizens through the language of mothers um, versus whores. So these kind of polarized um, images, especially of female um, uh, bodies, but not, not exclusively female bodies. Um, and people use these languages and rhetorics to both oppose and justify military aggression. Um, I'm going to come back to that. So here we have a few images um, from newspapers. These, these at the top here are from um, the Serbian newspaper Nin um, from 1991. And so you can see, as I sh put it down here for you, well, let me get my little pointer out again. The outline of the U state of Yugoslavia is here as a pair of women's breasts with the, the word mother underneath it. And here a woman is nursing the state of Yugoslavia. So we have these highly, um, highly gendered images of the state um, and and who and who belongs, who gets to represent it. Um, <clears throat> and go to the next one here. And around this, you have an extraordinary amount of of ethnic hate rhetoric that was also highly gendered. Um, so um, some of this discussed Muslim women as birthing too much and are subservient to their men. Um, Muslim men rape. Um, this was used to mobilize massive rape campaigns later. We've been raped by then, them. Now we're going to rape them back, um, targeting Muslim and Croat women during the wars. You have a 1980s migration of Serb peasants, so really poor populations of Serbs um, from Kosovo that were represented in the Serbian press um, as being cleansed um, as a genocide against the Serbs. This is in 1987, um, so prior to when fighting uh, broke out in Bosnia in 1992 and really erupted in Kosovo almost 10 years later. But the buildup and the kind of media rhetoric around this and media frenzy around this is getting, is getting really, really strong, um, and that all Serbian women um, are whores, that the women who in Kosovo would um, be with Albanian men or, or um, Bosniak men, that, that they're, uh, you know, these are the stereotypes that are flying around, right? Um, those images before that I showed you were from Dubravka, um, uh, not Ugaric, uh, Zharkov's book. Um, so this is not, um, this is not, I mean, we can think about the ways that this kind of vocabulary and this kind of language is not particular necessarily to this case in this instance. There are lots of ways in which we in the United States use these kinds of metaphors to talk about desirable and undesirable citizens, who, sh who's, who should have babies and who shouldn't. Um, so this is not par particular to this 
case, um, but the specific uh, ways in which it played out are. Um, so you had collective protests initially reported on, in one day in this creation paper, Vesnik, um, over here on the left are um, people, men and women, um, some parents, some not, protesting the draft of, um, of young people to fight in, the, in first in Croatia and then, well now in, this is in Croatia because this is in 1991. Um, but you have, um, and then the very next day, the, these same protests are um, reported as mother's protests. They're no longer parents' protests anymore, they're mothers' protests. And what this does is allows a kind of discounting of that political activity. Um, although women had really made strides during the, the socialist era in, in Yugoslavia in terms of um, the infrastructure of the state and having more presence in that arena, for women to be in the streets was still highly taboo um, uh, in this kind of protest uh, form. Um, and, uh, there, and, and kind of not really taken that seriously. And there's a way in which kind of portraying this, this protest that was not just mothers, um, as, as just mothers and it's only mothers and juxtaposing those protests to, um, it's difficult to see here, but these are bombed out houses um, in, in Vukovar in the region that was ethnically cleansed in, in Croatia, in southern Croatia. Um, and, uh, and, and so the implication is also that, you know, you're protesting, but, you know, who's going to take care of avenging this? You know, what if this continues to happen? Um, so again, also kind of discounting the protests. So that, that's kind of, in many ways, the framework um, that a lot of people were subject to during the wars in uh, the 1990s. And you have people then migrating to the United States, um, starting in 1992 as refugees, and actually quite, um, quite a number of refugees from former Yugoslavia, particularly Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, between 1992 and 1997. It didn't stop after 1997. It's, it significantly slowed, then picked up again in 1999 for a bit. Um, but there, there was quite, a, quite an influx. And I would imagine, actually, that for those of you who teach in Chicago, you probably have had or have students who are part of that um, migration to the city. I know I, I have. Um, so this, this refugee population, very few had connections and resources to, to leave without refugee agency assistance. Um, some people did, some people were able to get out kind of through personal connections and so on um, prior to when the fighting started, but most people did not. Um, Majority were displaced and arrived as refugees, primarily Bosniak, um, or in mixed families. Um, and I'm, I'm only, Bosniak is, is um, people who identify as Bosniak trace their conversion to Islam to the 15th century um, Ottoman conversions. Um, and some people prefer that term and some people prefer to just be called Bosnians. Um, maybe they're Muslim, maybe they're Catholic, maybe they're, um, they're Serb or, um, or Orthodox. So um, I'm going to use Bosniak some here, but interchangeably also with, with Bosnian Muslim, except for if I'm quoting people, which in this paper I'm, I'm not. The Bosniak term? Um, most recently, I mean, it really took hold in the 1970s um, and, and has kind of built since then, but it was introduced um, earlier in the late 19th century. <laughs> A lot of people didn't use it until the breakup. Yeah. 
Right. So Muslim, right. So there's a, I mean, we, um, there's a lot of material out there about that. And there's, the, you know, Muslim as a category was introduced in the 1971 census in Yugoslavia. That was a new thing. One of the things that was particular to Bosnia Herzegovina is that out of the six republics, there wasn't a um, kind of, it wasn't the homeland to a constituent nation, um, unlike uh, Serbia or Croatia. Um, Bosnia was was always supposed to be multi-ethnic um, and and not the homeland for one kind of given ethnic group. Does that help? Yeah. But there's, but people, I mean, you know, labels are debated and and contested, and particularly in this region, what people want to call themselves, what other people want to call them that they don't want to get called. Um, so, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Correct. Did you? Did? Yeah. And some people use that term who identify as Muslim and from Bosnia, and some people don't. Um, so, and, and so, yeah, you can also, it might help to think about it as Bosnian as being a, a citizenship, and Bosniak refers to an ethnic group. Um, all right, so U.S. family reunification immigration was practiced by many in really expansive terms. So this is what I was talking about, kind of the, the frameworks in which people are able to migrate um, between 1992 and 1997. U.S. still had very generous family reunification policies, which meant for certain groups that you could, as long as you sponsored and said you were going to sponsor this family member, you could, it could be a cousin, an aunt, a a great aunt, a um, grandmother, an uncle, um, a son, a sister, a brother, so kind of much more expansive. Those, those family reunification policies are much more restricted now um, than they were in the early 90s. So all of these, all of these things, um, all of these elements really shaped people's experience of migrating here. The domestic space is really, really a major site of investment, um, a site of conflict, and a site of refuge. I think we could think about it um, in all of those ways. Um, what I have here as examples of the significance of the domestic sphere um, is, again, that picture from the Devon um, Market Isle. You can't see it really well here, but several of the coffee brands from the region have um, uh, female servers who look very happy um, and domestic, bringing the trays of coffee. Um, uh, and then there's this one here that actually has a picture of, um, of Bosnia on it and of the region, I think, in Bihaj, um, where, where, the, where this coffee comes from. Um, so these, these kind of commodities from the homeland also um, help to um, uh, kind of support a sense of nostalgia, um, but also have gendered themes um, of the home life um, and of service within the home. 
Uh, here we have uh, a now defunct Chicago publication, Zambak, um, uh, the Turkish word for lily. And this uh, uh, service here, this Jezva service, um, is a hammered copy, a uh, hammered copper set that's very um, kind of known for the, the region of Herzegovina is known where that city most are that I showed you a picture from before is from. Um, and this, this kind of coffee service signals um, a, a, a status to be able to have that kind of service, um, to be able to serve coffee in that way um, is a status signal. So these elements of home, um, you know, to kind of think only about refugee life as these particular policies that people are engaging with um, at the legal system, this is one element. But this element of home and domestic space um, is also kind of a really big part of shaping people's senses of of who they are here, who they are in connection to, to where they came from, and also a place with a lot of kind of status difference and um, political debate and, and, and other sorts of things get worked out, um, as we all well know, probably, from our own home experiences. That earlier migration of um, people from former Yugoslavia to, to Chicago, um, uh, can kind of in some ways best be encapsulated by this picture here of these men. If any of you know the north side at all, this is the elevated stop at Broadway and Sheridan, where actually um, a lot of people from former Yugoslavia live now in Edgewater and Rogers Park. Um, uh, and so these men here are working on la laying that tunnel there that, um, I don't know if it's gas or not. Um, so what you would often have in these kinds of migrations uh, were men who would come. Um, migration scholars kind of refer to this as male chain migration, um, where you would have one man who then, maybe a son who would send for a brother or for his father. Um, and a couple of them might come over and work. And a lot of people went back. So you really would come and labor for 10, 15, 12, seven years in the US, and you would go back. And you might come back again one more time, or you might never come back. Um, but the idea was always to go back, and many, many people did. Um, in this newer, more recent migration, and I'm skipping over a few other chains, but I'm talking here specifically about people coming from, from the Bosnian region, um, you have a majority female displaced population, um, and entire families at once. So think of how different that is to have an individual coming versus, you know, entire families coming over um, together. So you have women like Ifeta, who's in this, in this first gold realty um, uh, advertisement here. Um, who she wants to stay in the United States. She's going to sell people homes here. Here's the happy, happy family, um, the, the Kavajic Kav family um, here, who's written her a letter of thanking her for the house. This is, of course, before the market tanked. A lot of people now are in foreclosure. Um, it's actually kind of wide, widespread problem. Um, uh, um, but people might also invest in post-conflict reconstruction efforts by sending money back to family in Bosnia. So you might have that group of people that Howard referred to before who went back to kind of reclaim property um, or try and sell property. But you also have people here sending a lot of money back, um, like to this young woman here. This is outside of um, Mostar. And she's showing me the, um, these are prefabricated cement uh, railings that are basically going to go up and replace this old, you can't really see it, but it's kind of rusty, um, that her family here in Chicago, who I know, had helped fund um, the purchase of those materials and also the building of this um, awning here. So this was a house that had sustained a lot of damage during the war, and um, now they're kind of doing this whole, uh, this whole refurnishing. So a lot of people send back money and invest in property that way, but you don't hear as much talk about desiring um, to return. Another element that really shaped this arrival was that Bosnians arrived as refugees under the personal responsibility, work opportunity, and responsibility. Um, personal responsibility, work opportunity, and reconciliation act. 
um, that was enacted in 1994 through 1996. Um, there was intense scrutiny and criticism of any use of public social services, so they arrived during this time. They also arrived um, when this massive privatization that, Brian, you referred to earlier of this public-private partnership, um, their refugee resettlement is highly privatized in the U.S. Um, big agencies put out bids to the government and then get reimbursed uh, per client for whom they relocate, um, but people still get very few services. Um, tend to be, it tended to be about three months of temporary um, assistance to needy families assistance. Some ESL classes, not many. Um, and then straight to work, often in housekeeping, sometimes meat packing, day labor construction. Um, really low entry service industry positions, so people might be stocking shelves in the back at the Target or at the Walmart um, or the TJ Maxx. Um, so lots of status loss through the war um, and also now through the migration. So people who lost um, homes, property, other forms of social relations during the war, also then coming to a new country uh, had to contend with a lot of status loss here. Um, so people were also met with narrative reproductions of the war for audiences in Chicago. So at the same time as they're arriving, there are these kind of captivated audiences who are captivated by um, the horrors of what has happened and a lot of dramatic reenactments. So I put two examples up here. I went to many, many of these during um, my field work. The, the one on the left took place in Millennium Park, um, was produced by a Polish theater troupe. The one on the right uh, is a feature film um, that uh, featured Bul Bulgarian and Ukrainian actors but who were playing um, Bosnians and Croatians. Um, and gender antagonism was often the key focal point in these kinds of productions. Uh, so you can see it even in the, in the kind of ticket stub for Lana's reign um, that her brother Darko is over here and has the patch over his eye and looks very um, swarthy and, and, and dangerous. Um, and in the end, um, she kind of liberates herself from her past, which is represented by her brother. So it's represented by this kind of dark masculine um, presence. You also had in the actual news media this kind of gender polarization representation. So um, this is a New York Times article. Um, it's titled Two-Sided Saga. It's from 2007. Um, and you see here that even the juxtaposition of these two people, so this is Almina and this is Addis, um, and that Elmina is presented throughout the story and even in the images um, as successful, engaged with children. Um, she's really a success story. We learn in, 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 the, in the story that both of them spent time in concentration camps. Um, but it's Addis who we're to be worried about, who seems really, who seems disengaged, apathetic. He's not looking at the camera. Um, and this came um, just a couple months after um, Suleiman Talovich, uh, a Bosnian young man, 18, in Salt Lake City, went on a shooting spree and killed six people. Um, and really, uh, you know, kind of one of those mass events that we have had here. Um, and this was the kind of news media coverage following that, which in some ways the reporter described as wanting to provide a um, more balanced sense of the Bo of Bosnian presence in the U in the U.S., but also ends up kind of worrying us about this this man here and what is he doing or not doing. Um, people were really aware of these kinds of representations when I when I when I spoke with them. Another way in which narrative worked is that people were encouraged to tell their stories to others. Um, this is a really, um, I think, kind of important and interesting area for students to be introduced to, especially uh, give, um, depending on how old they are. The idea of, there was even a kind of a comment this morning of, you know, it's so nice to hear um, real life stories of real people, um, but there's also a way in which certain kinds of stories being elicited constantly can become very problematic. Um, and so uh, here's one, one example. This was uh, kind of took place in a park district over, again, on the north side. 
um, in 2000. And we see that the event is described as women of Bosnia and that it's geared towards women who want to hear the real life stories of women who survived the war in Bosnia. Their experiences will change your life forever. Um, so the idea is that you can kind of hear these stories that are going to transform your life. There's not a lot about what their life was. You're going to go hear some kind of narrative, um, probably a victim narrative, um, but it's, it's, it's kind of important and interesting, I think, to think about who the audience is and who you're telling for. Um, so these kinds of uh, victim narratives were both part of that earlier um, set of representations that I showed you that were based in former Yugoslavia, um, you know, kind of which groups I perceived themselves as being victimized. Um, but also um, there's, a, there's a U.S. side to it, and there's a U.S. side to these women's and faith-based groups um, and I don't mean to glom all, all kind of not-for-profits not doing really amazing work into that, into that kind of non-reflexive relationship, but, there, but there, is, there, there is this issue at hand of kind of what, what kinds of stories are being elicited for which audiences and why. Um, uh, there's, there can be a tendency to engage in a rescue politics that support a victim narrative rather than a survivor narrative. And we could think a little bit about what might be some of the differences between relaying a, victim, a narrative of victimization as opposed to a narrative of um, surviving a, 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 an event in which you indeed were victimized. Um, <clears throat> Women were often used, so these are two Srebrenica memorials, again, to provide um, narratives of memory, but that also in involved a lot of um, victimization rhetoric. So you have here, um, this is in Daly Plaza in 2005, an event that I went to. Um, I'm sorry, I have better photos of these, but they didn't make it into this presentation, so you can't see all of the signs there um, that are protesting genocide, and, and, and really, um, and people really, uh, uh, needing to and wanting to publicly commemorate that massive event, which was really the, the one that you probably all know about in which um, 8,000 men and boys were killed in Srebrenica, which was a municipality that was supposed to be UN, it was a designated UN safe haven in 1995, um, but men were systematically over the of course of several days um, murdered. And, uh, and, and there's still a lot of denial about the fact that that event indeed took place. Um, and so even now, with Mladic's capture um, earlier this month, you see a lot of uh, protests, people coming out in Banja Luka and other places um, wanting to argue and say that this didn't happen. And so for people in the diaspora um, for whom it did it was a part of their lives. This is a big event to commemorate. There will be commemorations this year in July. Um, this was last year, so this was 2005. This is 2010. Both of these are in Chicago. Um, here you have a sign that says, don't forget the genocide, Srebrenica. Um, and this is in a conference room, a university conference room. Young women were um, actually the same young woman in both of these events, was, who was six at the time, was asked to deliver the narrative that kind of started off the event. Um, so women are very um, central to how memory is supposed to be carried on. Um, but not everybody was willing and is willing to kind of participate in that kind of mem mem memorialization. So I've got some pictures here of some young women um, who combined, this is, a, this is a Srebrenica commemoration that was on, took place on Capitol Hill in 2009. So that was the, the scene that you saw earlier of um, Eddie Bernice Johnson. Um, and combined Boss Fam Weavers of Hope, um, which is a not-for-profit that's based in Srebrenica, um, where women weave, and a lot of their 
carpets. They have carpets like these that are based on the same idea of the old, um, if you remember the AIDS quilts um, of the 1980s that would have squares commemorating the people who had passed on as a result of um, HIV AIDS. These, each square designates one of the men um, who was lost in, in the Srebrenica massacres. Um, so this woman organized the event with bringing in the, the, the non-for-profit. Um, she combined it with International Women's Day, which is a socialist holiday, uh, and then uh, kind of access to US political power. Um, she was a lobbyist, and so also her kind of project is to um, keep working for a unified Bosnia-Herzegovina um, on Capitol Hill, so kind of swaying the US to continue to support that position as opposed to um, secession of Republika Srpska, which is the region that she's from. Um, and I also uh, ha had another woman who stood up really in the middle of one of these performances and, and may declared, you know, we are not refugees anymore. Um, so this debate um, is going on, um, is still going on with people about uh, what is our role, who are we, um, we're not refugees anymore, are we victims, we're not victims, are we survivors, maybe we're not. But these, these debates are very important because they indicate the boundaries around um, this category of refugee and also highlight the fact that that's something that you can become and then something that it's, it, it's, it doesn't just erase previous histories and it also is a category that you're supposed to be able to move through officially. Um, it's not supposed to be a permanent uh, status. So I think what I'm going to do now is I have a couple of just kind of wrapping up points and statements, uh, and then I'm happy to take some questions about this. Uh, I've brought us back to these three, nation, home, and body, which I kind of loosely organized the lecture around that first instance of who belongs to the post-war nation of Yugoslavia, but also who kind of gets to belong in the U.S., um, and also the significance of home, both kind of post-conflict reconstruction there and building a home here. Um, and then the ways in which bodies are central to this, both the kind of dead body um, uh, commemorations of events like uh, Srebrenica, but, but, but many others, um, and the ways in which certain bodies figure the nation, and the ways in which um, certain bodies and kind of embodied practices are supposed to carry on memory and are charged with carrying on those memory traditions. Um, so I think that we can think that about these ways of, that national belongings articulated and contested in gendered terms in both former Yugoslavia and in the United States. Um, we have examples of that in Republican motherhood, 18th uh, century here, um, 18th and 19th century. Uh, and also uh, kind of most vociferous, I mean kind of its newest iteration in people like Sarah Palin who, although she's going for political office, again you have the kind of role of mother as being the primary political um, position, subject position, the kind of ticket to the public arena. Um, the creating home space is a key migrant focal point and reveals varieties of statuses such as gender, age, religion, political and kin relations that channel processes of integration. So we really can't ignore what's going on in, in the home. And I know for those of you, especially if any of you kind of are teaching younger kids or high school kids, um, the home is a place where you get a lot of political subjectivity being being built um, and a lot of debate and, and ideas. And, and I think it's one of the things that feminist studies and gender studies in particular has kind of reminded us continuously that you can't ignore this the ways in which this domestic sphere is very much implicated in, in the official political um, events. Uh, and that the work of memorializing the dead is valued and involves gendered labor and embodied practices. Um, so this is kind of a big activity for people and it's something that's really important. Um, these practices and associated representations are sometimes contested and used to produce varieties of diaspora affiliations. Um, so I could talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A too. Um, here I want to, I just have a couple of suggestions for what this kind of approach, kind of what taking um, a case, a case study approach and looking at it through kind of um, gender in particular and an and historical lens can help students um, to do, to kind of 
gain insight to barriers to and vehicles for civic engagement. Um, so these are all really ways in which they learn more about their world um, and the way that their world is shaping newcomers and also the ways that new sh newcomers shape the worlds that they're moving in. Um, they can gain a better understanding of the variety of subject positions from which people approach their migrant statuses. So again, kind of breaking this category of the, of the unitary migrant or, or, or refugee, um, that there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. And that what's going on in there um, help them to develop their ability to identify continuities. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of um, variety there, but there's a lot of um, continuities and disjunctures um, between previous and recent migrant cohorts that can indicate kind of persistent structural inequalities um, and the formation of new, newly marginalized populations. Um, so these are some of the ways in which I think that you could use this way of approaching migration um, to teach students about what's kind of specific to their time and era. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll wrap it up. I'll go to my thank you, the end slide. and. Um, <laughs> and see if you have any questions for me. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting, right, how we use these terms of community because, um, yeah, I mean, uh, so there, there are those kinds of more typical um, uh, uh, traditional ways of, of maintaining um, kind of a cultural identity and especially kind of for the city of Chicago, those are traditional ways, right? So you can get grants for a, a folk dance troupe and you can get um, grants for certain kinds of, of cultural practices. Um, so that's, again, part of the context. But yeah, there are, there are actually numerous, um, ho basically hometown associations. If you're from Cozarats, if you're from Priador, if you're, the, you know, kind of, it, these, these are the big organizations, the soccer clubs, the, um, the you know, there's a couple of mosques, there's, um, there's a lot of, of those kinds of organizations. The biggest thing is the big picnic that's coming up on July 4th. Um, you're talking about Bosnian U.S. Veter US veterans. There certainly are veterans of the Bosnian Wars who came here. Um, uh, that's a good question about whether or not people are um, uh, collecting benefits um, or organizing socially around those. Uh, that's something I'm not aware of. That's a good thing to think about. Um, that's hard to tell, too, uh, partly, um, partly because the census, I, I need to look now at the 2010 data, but in the when I was doing my research, the 1990 to 2000 census, there was no category for Bosnia as a place of origin. You could choose um, Yugoslavia, you could choose Serbia, you could choose Croatia, um, but you couldn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a um, because it wasn't a recognized state when the when the first census data got issued in the 1990s. So. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, uh, estimates are that there's probably about 140,000 in the U.S. who came as a result of those wars. Um, not necessarily all Bosnians, but a lot from, former, from, from Bosnia. Um, and in Chicago, um, I mean, I put it conservatively at around, um, I'd say maybe 16 to 20,000. You'll see higher numbers than that. Um, it, they could be that there's higher numbers. There's been a lot of movement too because a lot of people came to Chicago but then went to Nebraska and St. Louis. St. Louis actually has a larger Bosnian population now than Chicago. Um, so, you know, again, people on the move, right? Um, and people, even if they're war refugees, looking for work and looking for homes and places to live. So, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure about the numbers there. I'm kind of cautious about that. It was, Chicago was the largest relocation site out of Europe, outside of Europe. Sorry. So the, so the question was about the article that, that um, 
that I have uh, titled that um, will come out in the September issue of American Anthropologist. But uh, yeah, that's based on um, Chicago-based field work. Uh, and um, uh, it's really about the ways in which people use um, kind of looking at coffee practices as a way for people to evaluate um, the transformation, the kind of shift from living in former Yugoslavia to living in, um, in, in a post-socialist uh, space and in Chicago. Um, so I, I look at um, home sites where people are serving this kind of Bosnian um, coffee or Turkish coffee. I look at um, a restaurant that a Montenegrin woman runs over on the north side. Um, and, uh, and also kind of uh, community centers and talk about um, kind of shifts in time and pacing in time. A lot of people, a lot of the field work was based with people who came of age under socialism. Um, and so the ways in which they're kind of reading um, the demands, the work-a-day demands of a neoliberal um, kind of intensively capitalist environment um, uh, is, is through elements of time um, and commenting on time. And so I look at this practice, which is all about kind of a slow service, a slow brewing. A, it's a stovetop brewing that you have to do. It's very slow. It's very ritualized. Um, young people get uh, scolded for bringing coffee in from Starbucks and stuff outside into the home. Um, it's a way of... Um, uh, without kind of uh, getting you know, making it a nostalgic category itself, it's a it's a way in which some of the talk and stuff that emerges when that kind of coffee is going on um, is a way is a lot about of a kind of evaluating circumstances here and is a way about valuating um, people for whom the, you know there there was a lot the. Um, They've survived a lot, um, and it's a way of kind of providing pride and status. Um, it's associated with the Ottoman era, and thus kind of associated with a certain kind of Islam. Um, and uh, not that it's only practiced by Muslims, but it's it's a way of kind of evaluating that kind of status and asserting that kind of status. So I don't know if that answers the the question very well, but um, but you should read it. I think it's a it's a really interesting article <laughs> when it comes out. Yeah. Um, so the question was: There's apparently a book, a, 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 a girl's diary. That's a okay. It's called the. It's um, Zlata's diary, and it's 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 a book written by a girl. Was it written during the wars? So it was written during the wars, not after the wars. During the wars. Okay. Good teaching tool for middle school kids, it sounds like. Thank you. I really couldn't tell you. I know that, that Turkey was one of the relocation sites. I know people who have gone there and stayed there. Some people went there before they came to Chicago. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of people who lived for a couple years in Germany or in Croatia or Italy before they came to Chicago. Um, so some of those people were also in Turkey before they came here.
Yeah, so the question was, um, um, is there, it, could we talk about there being a transnational flow of migration? And the way in which you worded it was, um, are there people going back and forth? Um, and um, so my answer to that is um, absolutely yes. Um, I also kind of subscribe to, Nina Glick-Schiller has this configuration of transnational social fields, um, transnational ways of belonging and being um, that don't require you you to leave and go cro actually cross state borders, but I mean, that are about kind of cultures engaged in and maintained over the internet. Um, people may not go back to Bosnia, but they go visit their relatives who are now in Sweden. Um, so there's, I mean, there's tons of movement. Um, there are people now who are going back to Bosnia um, because they've been foreclosed on here or they've lost their job here and um, there they might give it a go there. Um, so there's been a lot of back and forth. I had one woman who lives now. She started off in Massachusetts. She went to live in Germany. Then she came back to Massachusetts. Then she went back to Bosnia. And then she came back to um, uh, Missouri um, and now has been in Missouri. Uh, so she went back twice and tried living first with her sister in Germany. She's an older woman who is in her 60s. Um, so it was a lot of movement and not a, not a privileged woman at all. Um, but she, she had a really difficult time and was just bound and determined that she could find her right place in one of these places. Um, so there is a lot of movement. It is more difficult now visa-wise, um, although a lot of Bosnians do, do have... Um, citizenship, especially younger people, um, and were eligible for citizenship, are a, a lot of them eligible for citizenship. So um, that also kind of makes mobility a little bit easier. But I would say that um, there's tons of stuff going on transnationally, um, even if people aren't able to afford, which a lot of people are not able to afford to go back now as, as they wish they could have um, or, or might be able to do in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.